And so, the black chair is now beyond repair. To be fair, it's held up very well for something made as cheaply as possible in a jungle clearing by slave labour under a communist dictatorship. But now, it's no longer suitable for cassette videos. And then the studio itself. Next door neighbour had their roof repaired, just their roof, and then shortly afterwards, by some strange coincidence, it started to leak in and make everything damp and mouldy. So, the future doesn't look bright for doing videos in there anymore. What a shame. Oh well, I guess we'll just have to slum it in here. So as a way of an introduction, rather than reinvent the wheel, I might as well just take you straight to Wikipedia's page on the Nakamichi Dragon. And it says a lot that, you know, a single piece of audio equipment has its own dedicated page on Wikipedia. That means it must be something significant for it to dedicate an entire page to it. But all the pertinent details are here. Insofar, it was made by Nakamichi in 1982 and marketed until 1994. Twelve years, that's quite a long time really for one model. Uh, it's a first nap model with bi-directional replay capability. Uh, you know, auto or reverse, but again, it's replay. This does not record in both directions. It only plays in both forward and reverse, and it doesn't have a rotating head. It's simply got a playback head which has two lots of two stereo channels, so that, a bit like um, in Walkman's, you know, it plays in one direction, and then when the auto-reverse kicks in, it simply plays the tape backwards, but it drags it over the other side of the head where it picks up the signals from. It's also the first production tape recorder with an automatic azimuth correction system, NAAC, Nakamichi Automatic Azimuth Correction. Uh, and if you don't know why that is decent or what that's all about, I'm just going to interject here with a bit of a video I did earlier in the year on some Luxman cassettes, which also used to uh, interfere with the azimuth as part of their raison d'etre. So here's a little quick refresher, unless you're not really sure what I mean by azimuth. So I'm going to be talking to you about azimuth. Now, it might be a new term to some of you, you old hands will know what I'm talking about, so this really isn't going to tell you anything new. But what is the azimuth? Well, it's not unique to tape decks, as we can see here, it's to do with, you know, measurements and angles and spherical coordinates and angular measurements and all that, but that's all very nice, but what's that actually got to do with cassette tapes? Well, let's just look at how a cassette actually runs, right? We've got a head, and most heads are a two-channel head, you know, unless you've got an auto-reverse deck when it's a four-track head, or if you've got a four-track recorder like, say, a Tascam Porter Studio, but most decks are two-track heads. Don't comment if I've got left and right the wrong way around here. This is just to get the concept across. So you've got two heads, sorry, you've got two tracks, a left and a right. And on top of that, you've got the tape that covers all four tracks. But on the tape itself, the tape itself has four tracks. So we have two tracks, one going over the left, one going over the right, in the head and that's got the signal on it yeah and that's what's read as the tape passes over it okay now as you can see here it all fits nicely so we've got the whole of the head being covered by the tape and each track going over each part of the head that it should be going over giving it full signal that's what we call a perfectly aligned azimuth but here's the thing why would you adjust an azimuth? Well, the azimuth, i.e. the placement of the head in the deck is usually held there and there's usually a couple of springs and at the front of the head there's some screws which adjust the spring. Now the thing is, over the years, these springs, the metal, they could be compressed, they could have got more compressed or they could have got stretched or someone's had a tinker with it anyway or someone's dropped the deck and it's damaged how the head is held in place, you, you don't know. 
But what happens is if these springs move, then the head and the actual left and right two tracks also move. And if we look here, if this is a bit over exaggerated, but if they move enough, you can see that the signal isn't covering all of the headspace. So the actual heads are not reading all of the tape. They're missing part of the tape. It's not being fully done. And so this is why azimuths go out of alignment and that can make the tape sound wrong, mostly dull. So this is why you need to adjust it. The other important bit is, at the time of its introduction, the Dragon had the lowest ever wow and flutter at highest ever dynamic range, losing marginally to the former Nakamichi flagship, the 1000ZXL, in frequency response. What we're going to think is that cassette decks aren't just about the head and the mech. It's also about the electronics on the boards, the chips, the capacitors, how the old audio hardware's singled out. We shouldn't judge decks just purely on their cassette mechanism and their heads because the audio hardware at the back of it adds a lot to it. You know, insofar as, you know, we look at amplifiers, that has no interface. It is just all audio hardware. Audio hardware? Audio hardware. So what's on that board, the transformers, the chips, etc., add to the sound quality and likewise a cassette deck is more than just a cassette mechanism it's also about what's on the board and this sort of says it all here competing models from sony studer tamburg tx were introduced later in the 80s sometimes surpassed the dragon in, me in mechanical quality and feature set but could never deliver the same mix of sound quality flexibility and technological advancement the dragon despite inherent issues with long-term reliability, remained the highest point of compact cassette technology. Now, you know, this is Wikipedia. This is someone's thoughts. This isn't fact. This is someone's opinions. But it's not been taken down. And that's the thing about the Dragon. It's a, a standard, if you will. It's sort of like so important when it comes to cassette decks that it coins phrases, you know, you don't hear many people talking about a cassette deck being a Sony ES killer, or you don't hear them talking about being a TXZ series killer, but the most used phrase to show that a cassette deck is punching above its weight is when someone describes it as a dragon killer, and there's a reason why the dragon is a target, simply because it could well have been the best that the cassette format ever got for home decks. Or any decks, to be honest with you, because, let's be honest, the Dragon will have been used in studios. But enough of me talking. Let's have a look at this beast and see why it's so good, what makes it tick, and why I like it so much. The truth. <laughs> And here it is in all its glory, the Nakamichi Dragon. So, my story with this deck goes back to around 1995. Not, not with this particular one, but the first time I encountered a dragon was in 1995 because at the age of 14 in the early 90s, I used to buy and sell a lot of Sega and Nintendo games with my friends at school. And I used to sell them to a local shop. It was called the Swap Shop in my home, hometown of Accrington, if any of you are from around that area. And, um, you know, I, I knew the guy pretty well. He used to sell TVs, videos, hi fis computer games and stuff. And a bit like a, a modern cash converters pawnbrokers, but a bit classier. He didn't take everything. He didn't cash checks. He just took nice gear. And once someone, when I was 14, I went in one day and I said, can I work here, please? I don't want any money. I'm just bored. And he went, yeah, all right, because he knew me. And I worked with him for four years. That was my Saturday job for four years. And uh, I learned a lot. And... One of the things that came in one day was a Nakamichi Dragon in the late 90s. Well, late 90s, it was about mid-90s it was. And it was with this deck, the first three-head deck that I'd ever encountered, that I actually, for the first time, could hear what three-head decks did, how they worked, and why this was such a special deck. He was very, very happy when this came in stock. And it was only in stock for less than a day. I managed to 
play with it long enough to make a magnificent tape which we used as a demo tape for all the other tape decks when we were playing them for people on the Dragon. I remember it was on an 88SA, you see, I remember these things. Um, because he made a phone call to somebody and somebody excitedly turned up later that day and bought it and I still remember thinking, my goodness, who's spending over a thousand pound on a cassette deck? Because it was over a thousand pound then, second hand in the mid 90s. So yeah, that was my encounter. And ever since then, like I keep saying, perception is more important than reality. The Dragon has been the ultimate cassette deck for me. So let's have a look, a look at it and, and, and get a bit in close and see what everything's about. The, these are the line outputs, by the way. I mean, the, uh, this one's just for the headphones. You know, and I'm not so curious. This is what I use for studio headphones. They're a, they're a, a studio classic. They're the uh, Sony MDR7506. They've been using studios for years. I really like them. They're good enough for uh, not doing a very good job at showing them. Good enough for what I do, but some of you wanted to know. That's what headphones I use. And on the other side, there is a, a line out, and the line out is going purely into my Sony PCM D100 linear PCM recorder. I'm recording straight from the line out of the Dragon when we play it straight into this as a 48 kilohertz, 24 bit PCM WAV file. So that's what I'm recording the output for this video on. So that's what them wires are for. Anyhow, let's have a look at the deck itself. I'm doing it at an angle so the light doesn't reflect too bad, but it's down here. You see this, the NAAC, the Nakamichi Automatic azimuth correction. Again, it's a closed loop, three head, double capstan, direct drive. Um, it's also quartz locked, it doesn't say there, but uh, this is one of the few quartz locked NAC decks. So the, the meters are what they are. We've got the, um, the reset button for the meter. If we want to reset the clock timer, it, it, it does. It's just a. It's not linear. It doesn't count minutes or anything. It just counts in its own way. You've got a memory button there. Stop and play. If you want to do memory playback, etc. You've got the auto reverse on or off. If you want it to, when you're playing it to automatically play the other side or not. Now this is this is the business end, and uh, I think it might be called the Dragon because this sort of setup. Looks a bit like scaly dragon skin. So what have we got? Well, we've got, that's the play in reverse. That's the play regular going forward. My hand makes all the camera look funny. Maybe the black background wasn't the best idea. You've got the Q button for when you want to do some cueing, fast forward and rewind. You've got the record mute, the pause button, the record button, and then you've also got the fade in and fade out for the faders. Now, Nakamichi, categorized decks not as type 1, type 2, type 3 and type 4 but they categorize them this way. If we look here at the top we've got the type 1. Now type 1 is classed as EX and on the left of it we have the left and right calibration pots for the level and on the right of it the left and right calibration pots for the bias. Then underneath that lit up we've got SX which is type 2 and again the calibration pots and underneath that we've got ZX, which is type 4, and the calibration pots. Now, the other thing to note as well, like a lot of NAT decks, if we look at this, apart from we've got the monitor and the master input, we have left and right individual inputs. Now, what I do normally when I do a tape is I calibrate it up, and then I play a signal through, usually a thousand hertz, and I try and get that balance to zero, so I know that I've got the exact same level going in on both sides of the tape, because some have variances, say if you've got a bad tape, and then you crank up the master at the top to get it to the level you want. But anyhow, you've got individual EQ, so you can select whether it's 70 or 120 microseconds, Dolby on or off, there's B and C on it. The MPX filter is for if you're recording radio broadcasts, the subsonic filter is if you're recording records that have been badly mastered and they've got a lot of boomy subsonic stuff on there. And the auto record and pause, which is if you're using it with a timer. But that's it. And then basically you've got the output, which makes the output volume up and down. Why do they have stuff like that? Because sometimes you might have a CD player, because like CD players um, output what they put in. You put a, 
a test disc in with a thousand hertz tone at zero db that's what it's outputting and not all hi-fi equipment's the same so in this case you can vary the output as to higher or lower so that it matches all the rest of your stack you know, your stack your separates and your stack so that's basically what's on the front of the the dragon and what they do so i guess the first thing to do is to start with well let's calibrate a tape up and you've seen me do this lots of times but you've not seen me really do it um, in depth while I'm talking about it. So I'm just going to turn the old Sony on now and let's get some recording doing. So there's going to be test tones and we'll start there. But the point I want to make at this particular conjecture is this. Don't judge a cassette deck on how it performs with great cassettes. You know, most cassette decks, most decent cassette decks, you give it an SAX, it's going to perform well. You give it a metal, it's going to perform well. The good decks do that. The great decks can make great work out of cassettes like this, which is a, a used Sony FXI I got in a batch that I'm just plucking out and I don't even know what's on it. I just peeled the labels off and we're going to use this. And this is where the great decks stand out. This can make cassettes like this very common, very cheap cassettes. Incidentally, I say that though, this shell, this shell is the same as the 86 through to 90 HF. It's that great shell. It doesn't have the orange or red spools, but the hubs are the same as the 86 HF, excuse me. These are great tapes. But anyhow, these are still common, normal tapes. And the great decks can make these sound amazing, as we'll find out here. So all you do is you switch your deck on and it does like a little bit of blinking and everything. It's just like, I don't know what that is for, whether it's calibrating itself internally, but you've got to wait for that to stop. When it's stopped, you can wipe your tape in. So we'll put this tape in and then what we're going to make sure is that we're listening to the tape, not the source. I need this to be pushed out because it's 120 microseconds this because it's type one and I'm going to put it onto EX which is a type one. So fast forward the tape a little bit, stop it, record, pause and we got a little blip there. It was a used tape so we had a little blip but now it's recording. So press the level button. Now this level button says 400 hertz but I don't think it is. I don't know whether it's a problem with my deck or the crystal or what, but this doesn't sound like 400 hertz. But for the purpose of what we're doing, it'll do. So what we do now is if we look, we have a level meter. And if we can see there, if we can get it on focus, we need to get it where it says Cal, which is at zero. So if we look at the level meters now, it's almost there. So I don't really need to do much tweaking. I maybe just tweak the left pot just a little bit see if we can get it exactly bob on to zero but it's pretty much there it's there at zero okay so what we do next is we go into the bias and this is 15 kilohertz now watch this that means it's recording but if i switch over to the bias now that's going to start flashing ready And there's a whirring noise. What this is doing now is the NAAC azimuth is now adjusting itself to optimum position. You've got to let it do that before you start adjusting the bias. Because if we can see now, the bias is flickery and it's not quite at the zero calibration point. Yeah. So what we do now is we go over to these, which have now lit up very usefully. And I'm going to try and dial these into being zero as well. So we dial them up. Okay. Okay, that is as near as damn it zero. So the bias is now as good as it's going to be. Put it over to level, make sure that hasn't changed. Because if you change the bias from incorrect to correct, it can affect the level. Let's have a look. You see the level's just a little bit high on the right hand side, just a little bit. Let's just tweak it down a bit. Okay, so the level's good, and the bias is good. So that's how you calibrate the tape on the Dragon. So goody gumdrops. Let's now put some music into it, and I'm going to play something from the YouTube audio library. 
as always and this one just bear with me of the soaking to lock up this one is called Kreutz no it's not I'm not going to play Kreutzberg now I'm going to play one called X-Ray Vision so let's take the cassette where it is record pause it's now recording that isn't flashing because it's already calibrated to the tape let's have a listen to X-Ray Vision Like I say, judge the great decks on how they perform on common cheap cassettes like this as opposed to how they perform on expensive well-known cassettes. So what are my thoughts overall on the Dragon? Like I say, perception is more important to reality. More important is more important than reality. What we perceive as being true is what we believe more because we want to but i'm not however going to sit there and say that this is the best single cassette deck ever because it isn't but i'll try and use an analogy for you do you remember when you were young a card game called top trumps remember that top trumps it was a card game and you know you had various cards and they had like different stats about what they were. In these cases, these are 
little ones I made with, with audio cassettes on. And what you used to do was you used to battle the cards against each other. For in this case, the SKC versus the D90, I go, right, okay, so uh, let's have a look. The collectability, seven, two, right, I win that card. And there were always different categories. And in the pack, there was always what you would class as the top trump. And this was a card that would be very strong in all categories. It would still be beatable. It, it wasn't that it was unbeatable. You couldn't have a card that was unbeatable. Whoever had that card was simply win the game because you could never, ever get the unbeatable card from them. So this, to me, is the top trump. Is it the best recording deck ever made? No. There's arguments. I mean, from my own point of view, there's arguments. The likes of the ZX9 or the CR7, etc., is a better recording deck than the Dragon. But these are later decks than the Dragon. Is it the most reliable cassette deck in the world? No, it isn't. These are maintenance hungry. When these go wrong, you need to find specialised people to repair them. And the sad fact is, especially in the UK now, B&W, Bowles and Wilkins have stopped doing Nakamichi repairs now. And this, this, was, re, this was refurbished by B&W before I bought it about 18 months ago. So I think I've got a good few years in it yet. But they're not the most reliable cassette deck. They are complicated. And when they go wrong, it's expensive to sort them unless you really know what you're doing. Are they the best sounding playback cassette deck. I'd argue that's a strong suit with the NAAC. Yes, the CR7, you can manually do it, but that take into account the hardware behind it, the sound hardware. I think this could be the best playback deck of the lot. But as a package, as an overall, like the top trump, it's very hard to beat. Individual decks might have better individual features that may be better than the Dragon, but overall, as a package, if you can get one that's reliable and been overhauled, the Dragon's very hard to beat. It really, really is, and that's why it's a top trump. Add to that the legendary status, the name. You know, it's not a KC blah, blah, blah. No, no, it's a Dragon. But like everything, like classic Ferraris, classic Porsches, they need love. They're not a use every single day for the commute to work, burn your clutch out on the motorway. They're not for that. They need a lot of love and a lot of maintenance, but that's what makes them special. Sometimes, you know, nothing worthwhile is ever easy. If you've got the money and the time to get a dragon, to maintain it, to fettle it when it goes wrong. I mean, like I say, mine's been flawlessly, you know, reliable for the last 18 months it's been serviced. You get a great feeling of satisfaction from this deck. And plus, whenever people talk to you, you know, there's a, there's a bit of respect in the community if you've got a dragon. Well, there is, unless, unless you're a Tamburg owner. But yeah, it, overall, it is one of the best decks ever made. And you've got to take this thing into consideration when you're talking about this deck. Because a lot of people go, oh my God, dragons are £2,000. Yeah, £2,000 will get you a fettel dragon. That's not an insignificant amount of money for, both, for all of us. But let me just put this into context. For £2,000, you are buying one of the best ever pieces of equipment that was ever made for this particular hi-fi hobby in this particular field. You're not getting a good deck or one of, you know, the good decks. You're getting one of the best ever made. Remember the Wikipedia article? This could be all around the best ever made for £2,000. Now, you try and find one of the best ever, not a great, not a brilliant, but one of the best ever CD players ever made, you're not getting it for £2,000. You're not getting it for £10,000. I see CD players regularly going for £10,000. You're probably talking in the £20,000, you know, 10 times more expensive for one of the best ever CD players ever made as opposed to one of the best ever cassette decks ever made. And the same thing goes for amplifiers, the same thing goes for record decks. You are not getting one of the pinnacles of the format for anywhere near the price you can get one of the pinnacles of the format for cassette decks. So in that respect, these are a bargain. So take that as you will, but those are my thoughts on the Dragon. It's always been the ultimate deck to me. It's never let me down. It never makes anything other than superb recordings. 
it plays back, it, it is a playback deck, nothing plays except back better than the Dragon with the NAAC, it always finds a sweet spot and I don't have to mess around adjusting with it. And like I say, for me so far, treat it like something you love, don't batter it, and it keeps on working. And working examples of these are only going to go up in value, I believe. But your mileage might vary. Yes, you probably have some very different thoughts on this, but I'm talking to someone that's loved this deck from when he first used it over 25 years ago to one that's been using it pretty much daily for the past 18 months, and it hasn't let me down and it hasn't disappointed me in any way. It's a wonderful, lovely deck, and if you have the means, get a good service one while you can, because they ain't coming down in price. Sorry, boys, these are not gonna be in thrift stores for $20, unless they're broken to hell, or the entire cassette bubble bursts, which it might. So, I hope you enjoyed that video. I will be doing some more on my other decks, saying what I like and what I don't like about them. But until then, Please like and subscribe. Until next time, happy taping. Bye bye.